All right. Um, the name of this panel is Interdisciplinarity. I'm the moderator. My name is Michael Johnson. Um, I'm an MFA candidate here in our criticism program. Uh, the faculty correspondent is Deborah Balkin. Um, Deborah teaches here at SVA. So I was um, talking to a friend yesterday, and he asked me what I was going to be doing this weekend. I told him I was mediating a panel uh, that I'm calling interdisciplinarity. And he said, you mean interdisciplinary? And I said, no, I mean interdisciplinarity. And he said, oh, so you just decided to throw in the extra syllable. And I said, yeah, Jake, that's exactly what I did. I just decided to throw in the extra syllable. In a way, Jake's question is actually very fitting because there is some zest behind my name of this panel. It's supposed to be a little bit silly. It's as if someone came up to you on the street and said, uh, what do you think of interdisciplinarity? You'd say, well, I think it sounds lovely, but what does it mean? And that's the answer. The answer is, what is it? <laughs> Academia is full of these uh, mana terms. Uh, Levi Strauss calls them floating signifiers that we all have trouble understanding because they're referent, uh, uh, because either they have no concrete referent anywhere in the natural world or the referent is so diffuse that it becomes very difficult um, to consolidate it into a single word. Uh, now that I've gotten the humor out of the way, these are introductory remarks, humor is a part of the genre. I can try to describe what I'm calling, why I'm calling this panel interdisciplinarity. In truth, I was trying to solve a problem that I think is very complex, which is how to create a context that would be big enough to fit everyone in and to do it transparently so that after I'm finished talking, it's as if I'm not even here. There's a demand for increased complexity when you're dealing with a problem that's already very complex, and that is what interdisciplinarity does. As a method, it deals with problems that are already very complex. What I'm going to do to try um, and make the connections between these essays clearer, to make them problems they present more vivid, is to put the individual discernments of the essays in relation to each other, uh, from the so that from the perspective of the context of this discussion, the relations to each other will stand in for their individual determinations. In Robin Graham's very lucid essay, um, he will be the first presenter. Um, his essay is on the use of the space between images and indexes. Uh, there's a point where he notes a description by an anonymous indexer who is said to be the indexer of the first printed index, which, as it turns out, uh, was an index for St. Augustine's De Arte Prae di Candi, The Art of Preaching. The anonymous indexer left this note. Everybody who wants to find quickly something that is contained in this little book can find it, and not least also by means of various and many cross-references. Will it be revealed what is sometimes contained in these diverse passages of this little book at those points, which will prove to be the most fr fruitful for those who wish to study the book? Robin follows this quote with an argument. The first indexes of the Incanabula period were already developed in the same form we know them today which I would have to disagree with uh, for reasons that I will state in a moment. He goes on to support his argument with a nod to Thomas Hobbes. He summarizes Hobbes thus. The technology of print revealed what was already there in the medium of writing. By realizing that portions of text could be assigned a location, and we're back to Robin now, the process of linear reading could be transcended, and information could be readily accessed more easily. My problem with the idea that the first indexes were already developed in the same form that we know them today is that those indexes and their sort of dialectical value is the result of, being, of the text being tampered with, of being assigned a location, of being delivered elsewhere. The method for the delivery of indexes, I think, is of a piece with the form they take. And we do delivery a little differently now than we did in 1468. The level of indeterminacy is a little higher now than it was then. The location isn't always as obvious. Imagine what would happen if this anonymous indexer lost the index to De Arte Praticandi. Compare that what would happen to what would happen if I lost a book from one of these shelves. My position in this is spelled out uh, nicely in Rebecca Noon's, uh, the next presenter's, uh, darkly funny, the analog internet, mail art, and the comedy of futility. In it, she describes a project she's been doing, collecting deaccession materials from libraries, bookstores, anywhere, really, collating them however she likes and mailing them to more or less random people in the world. Re Rebecca says in her paper that the innate nature of the information contained in these books, the deaccession books, prevents them from passing the gatekeeper of immortality. 
Though I'm not exactly sure what the gatekeeper of immortality is literally, I think figuratively she's using it as a rhetorical device to stand in for the highest possible level of saturation that a text can attain in civilization. Rebecca's project is an entropic, obliquely tactical dissemination of so-called useless books, books that occupy the space in between print and image in indexical media a la Robin Graham. Continuing with this theme of the use of indexes in Zamila Karimi's essay, a wonderfully detailed and insightful account of the lived spaces of Occupy Montreal and Square Victoria, she says that a new temporary typology of living was created which was fluid and dynamic, full of potential to promote direct participatory actions and empowerment. Zamila's essay makes a very powerful claim on the 10th page regarding the media coverage of the Occupy movement and the success of the occupiers' tactics to garner support Zamilla writes, this was, profound and this was a profound movement, which I believe is the moment of our period when the world became a community, even if only virtually, in an ephemeral sense. As an aside, after I read her paper, I remember thinking that Zamilla's description of this turning point fits right into the recent history of debate that I've been learning about in Deborah's class, um, something Deborah will be able to address much more fluently than I will, uh, that we're not in a time of debate anymore. We are more or less in a time of consensus. Moore Cohen's paper, the final paper, is a very well-drawn map of artistic practices as they relate to the virtual and physical borders in tactical media. On the fourth page, Moore makes a provocative point. She says, the internet is not just a tool for tactical action, but also an essential part of, of late capitalist and global logic. Its power to change its structure is therefore limited. The moment of our period, which Zamilla argues is the turning point when the, when the world became a community through Moore's more stringent critique is also an essential part of late capitalist and global logic and its power to change its structure is therefore limited. I'm not suspicious about the value of the Occupy movement, but there are a lot of people, most of them uh, economists <coughs> and politicians, who would like to believe that the Occupy movement was more or less a historical footnote to capitalism. Later in Moore's essay, she re-addresses tactical media. She writes, tactical media is not concerned with statements about the impact it might have on the future or with establishing an alternative infrastructure for the subject of criticism. By refusing to become a consistent and stable strategy, tactical media always maintains alert vibrancy and constant awareness. In other words, the ephemerality of the Occupy movement was foreknown and inevitable. In closing, my intention for this panel, is, uh, my intention for the introduction to this panel is to begin with a discussion of each of the papers by locating the interdisciplinary reference, the cross-reference of these four papers, the space in between the indexicality of the f these four papers. Now, if you're thinking, Michael, how could you possibly locate an interdisciplinary referent, which you've already said is too diffuse to consolidate into a single word? I mean, Michael, is there even such a thing as an interdisciplinary referent? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> In the introduction to David Levy Strauss's book, From Head to Hand, John Berger says that if you want to understand what's really going on in the world, you have to use an interdisciplinary approach. Berger says that this approach is the starting point of any ac academic inquiry. When we find the right starting points, these interdisciplinary reference, as they often do, occur to us completely unprovoked when we are crossing the street, or when we are brushing our teeth, or when we are falling asleep. They are gifts. All right, our first panelist is Robin Graham. Robin is from um, the, Robin is a graduate student in the Department of English at Concordia University. His paper is See Also Between Print and Image in Indexable Media. So, Okay, we, so we typically use the word index in two senses uh, today. Um, the first is bibliographic. Um, a systematic organizing description used to aid the search of literature, 
whether academic or otherwise, that is typically included as a section, the back of a print object, mediating the searcher's relationship to the text. Um, the second and etymologically more recent use of the term is the scientific sense denoting a scale or register of an entity with res respect to some quantitative value, such as the a diversity index in the biological sciences or a cost of living index in economics. These two senses may seem quite different at first because they apply to different types of information. But at a foundational level, they both impl uh, involve the employment of a particular semiotics, the tripart theory of iconic, indexical, and symbolic science, performed by Charles Sanders Peirce, has considerable influence in semiotic practice and is not discussed only by specialists, but in a wide range of fields, including literary history, library science, communications, and art criticism. Peirce's formulation of the index is often referred to as the aspect of a sign that is really affected by its object. He provides the examples of a weathercock's indexicality to the direction of the wind, or a photograph's indexicality to the objects depicted. So, this is um, a description of sort of like what happens in uh, photographic processing. Um, so, the deployment of Peirce's indexicality in criticism is often, it, well, it can be brief and reductive, and as it has to account for a complex web of interrelations between iconicity and symbolism. Um, I want to suggest that engaging a semiotic understanding of indexicality with a material history of the other thing we call an index, that is in a bibliographic sense, um, we can come to some better understanding of how to make practical or theoretical use of the term. So James Elkin's art seminar on photography sets up indexicality as a central issue in discussions and debates over photographic and other types of image-based representation since the late 70s. Whatever conclusions are drawn from this debate, it reveals that using indexicality as a model for the relationship between an image and the object it represents is controversial. Um, the core of the disagreement of this issue is perhaps best read through the confrontation between Rosalind Krauss and Joel Snyder. Uh, Krauss wants us to hold on to the idea that photographs have a direct relationship to their objects. Um, for her, every photograph is the result of a physical imprint transferred by light reflections onto a sensitive surface. For Snyder, this may be true, but it isn't a necessary relationship. He states that when people talk about indexicality, they generally confuse photons with objects. They think that it is objects that are necessarily indexed by photographs. It may very well that be that objects are indexed, but nothing in the way of an object need be indexed by a photograph. It seems as if here Snyder wants to affirm photographic representation, which is made available to be indexed after the film is developed. Despite the fact that Snyder doesn't seem to win over the other participants in the seminar, I want to argue that his position is more in line with Peirce's tripartite formulation, as well as the function of the index in print history. But uh, let's, I want to say a little bit more about uh, Peirce's position. Um, so, in her famous essay on the role of the index in 70s R, Coase writes that indexes establish their meaning along the axis of a physical relationship to the reference. They are the marks or traces of a particular cause, and the cause is the thing to which they refer, the object they signify. This physical trace of the object finds expression in tracing, molding, and impression, but not in the pictorial language of drawing and painting. This is perhaps best expressed in her evocation of Duchamp's With My Tongue, My Cheek. Uh, so in this uh, self-portrait, Duchamp makes a sketch of his profile, on top of which he places a plaster cast of his uh, chin and cheek. Um, so for Kress, this is this manifests that, uh, quote, I got trauma of signification, which juxtaposes the indexicality of the cast with the iconicity of the drawing. This fracture in signification is too easily is too easy to properly fit in with Peirce's semiotics, where there are always degenerate forms of iconicity within the index, and vice versa. But more importantly, it seems to preclude representations for being really affected by their object by virtue of not being physical enough. After all, the particular configurations of Drew Duchamp's pencil across the page would not exist without the living artist and his face. <coughs> Peirce evaluates what he calls a sign, the degree of degeneracy of a sign from its object. Quote, a sign degenerate in the lesser degree is an obstinate sign or index, which is a sign whose significance of its object is due to having a genuine relationship to that object, irrespective of the interpreter. 
such, for example, as the exclamation hi as indicative of, his, of present danger, which I think is a little bit of an update. <laughs> I mean, like he means hey or watch out. Um, but, or a rap at the door is indicative of a present visitor. I mean, the, it signifies that someone is there, but it doesn't tell you exactly who. So, for purse, an index is a sign that can indicate or call attention to its object, regardless of the viewer or interpreter. This is how we can observe a portrait of someone we've never known as an obstinate sign or a dexical sign, that is, as an effect produced through the artist by the physical appearance of the portrait subject. Purse writes that an index an index represents object by virtue of its connection with it. it. Makes no difference whether this connection is natural, artificial, or merely mental. In the bibliographic sense of the term, this connection is a way of finding or retrieving information by directing the reader's attention to a certain place within the text. In connecting to a certain point, usually designated by a page number, other information is then excluded or excommunicated by virtue of falling outside the connection made by the index. Here a distinction to be made between information surrounding the designated term, the rest of the page or the text immediately surrounding the designation, and excommunicated information, all other undesignated pages, unused items in the index. While we have a theory that accounts for the former, the latter seems to go unaddressed. If we think about this in terms of the index ecology of a photograph, we should be aware of how attributing it to strictly the objects depicted might excommunicate information that isn't present in mere objects. The index should extend its epistemic purchase from beyond mere presence to the information that can be derived from it. to you, The Analog Internet, Male Art and the Comedy of Futility. So we inhabit a world saturated with superfluous information, a superfluous that extends beyond the vapid details of celebrity gossip or the pointless shampoo instructions that sit unread in our showers, though these examples are certainly part of the overall landfill of information gluttony. Our saturated information landscape also includes the mounds of books, magazines, and other printed materials that once sat on the bookshelves of our homes and libraries, but now, by virtu virtue of simply outliving their respective milieus and intrinsic sell-by dates, are left in free boxes at the end of driveways, or fill the deaccessioning bins of public libraries, rendered disposable by their initial stewards. These deaccessioned and discarded print materials contain information that will effectively never be used again, assuming that these books were ever used at all. <laughs> Recipe books with instructions on how to impress family and friends with a color-saturated corned beef supper. Paperback medical dictionaries from 1986 that provide handheld self-diagnoses abstracted from current medical advances. The Guinness Book of World Records from 1972, which we have, or 1973, with triumphalist accounts of the most tedious achievements. The instructive technical support guides to assist one with dot matrix printing issues, etc., etc. So those kind of books. We can only hope for a future when these printed hallmarks of the mundane are found by the social historians so that they can write about our respective, our inflated sodium levels, our reactive impulses to the mysteries of the human body, and our unique aptitudes for growing root vegetables to the point of inedibility. <laughs> these books inscribed with the easily forgettable are all the quiet, pointless hallmarks of printing and publishing realities in which presumably any kind of information, from the most banal to the most urgent, can be thrown through a press and come out the other end as a book. The book as commodity is generated with the consciousness that this new printed product would just as quickly be made irrelevant as it was made an object for consumption. So is information, when reduced to its most basic semantic representation, then devoid of meaning? Perhaps this gluttony and waste is just symptomatic of generating forms of didactic knowledge and instruction. Eventually, the majority of manuals and encyclopedias and reference materials will outgrow their intended use. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's best to update. That said, we still must bear the fallout of making all of the semantic information. This is semantic as opposed to kind of quantifiable and tropic forms of information and sort of computational philosophy uh, into making this material. 
So, and the fallout is waste, essentially. If we step back, we can see this process of materialization on our collective need to mechanize meaning, reflective of what computational and cognitive philosopher Brian Cantwell Smith calls the primary dialectic of intentional sciences, and indeed computing. This computational reality follows the, tra sorry, the trajectory of Marshall McLuhan's writing of print, who posits in the Gutenberg galaxy that the act of printing and its corollary of typography tend, and this is now McLuhan, tended to alter language from a means of perception and exploration to a portable commodity. As a mechanized commodity, information texts are dispensable resources even for the institutions that house them, the libraries, the archives. Even though the act of deaccessioning information is far from new, the act becomes magnified in the age in which information is so plainly abundant that times can be so devoid of informational relevance or even meaning. So, the Analog Internet, which I've been doing since 2012, is an ongoing international mail art series made in response to over-commodified and over-materialized information and functions as a humorous challenge to the archive. It's based out of Toronto and sometimes Montreal, just to further the Montreal <laughs> ties <laughs> from when I was there. Uh, in part, uh, the Analog Internet is mundane, or is a mundane, almost trivialized rendering of Jacques Derrida's notion of the archivalithic. I always have trouble with that. And the air of death that seems to hover over the archive, be it the death of the modernist archive itself or the act of deaths and eliminations that the archival processes are rooted in. Derrida argues, and this is Derrida here, if this word or these words or figures can be stabilized so as to, on a signification, will never be either memory or enemies as spontaneous, alive, internal experiences. So Derrida's questions, the primary motivation, so he questions the primary motivation behind this desire to and for the archive and the intentions of its gatekeepers. As we may expect from Derrida, the answer to this archival sickness is not the continued practice of preservation, but in the eradication of the archive. The analog internet is a decontextualized compilation of books that for the most part will probably never make it to the state sanctioned archives at all, just based on what they contain. The innate nature of the information contained in these books prevents them from passing the gatekeeper of immortality. However, if they have been collected by public institutions and repositories, such as the City of Toronto Public Library System, in the first place, there was something there, perhaps, that were of some relevance at some point. So basically, these books are deemed worthy of state purchase and state sharing within the public city municipal system, but they are stricken from their record, not worth keeping at some point. And they sort of are left from our memory of existence. These books, which are testaments to the mundane, are left and forgotten. So as a result, the analog internet positions the archive and the houses of collections as absurd gestures of futility, kind of why bother in the first place to preserve. The analog internet is composed of discarded books and deaccession library materials that are salvaged, cut up, rearranged, repackaged as an assemblage of decontextualized information stuffed into air mail envelopes, and surrendered to the mercy of the Canadian, American, international postal systems. Each envelope contains excerpts of print materials and curios that directly reference the internet or broadly reflect a rich information landscape. The overwhelming potential for knowledge gleaned from these thrown away how-to guides or outdated reference materials is rendered obsolete by time, incomprehensible by volume, there's just so much, and as a result, they're a tongue-in-cheek relief of the digital age. So the analog internet itself is self-aware archival iconoclasm, reflective of Flexus Robert Filio's creative good-for-nothingness. The act of preservation is, is rendered humorous as the work memorializes the abandoned, venerates the unsolicited, and entrusts the archaic. So the Project Mails Out collection, so I, these are books that I found at my school, actually, with faculty of information, so at a master's level it is a professional school for librarians, archivists, and such, and they're just like getting rid of preservation of library materials, so just the best image to me. The project mails out collections of deaccession library materials taken from the trash of public and private institutions, such as municipal libraries and academic institutions. So I go to the library bins, uh, to these deaccessioning bins in these libraries, to collect the books that are being thrown away. I also go into private collections, so those are the ones that are at the end of driveways that I take up. And I have a list of subscribers, but I also kind of commit sort of random acts of mailing as well. Uh, and I collect sort of addresses from people that I meet 
wherever I go and kind of forget about them and then come across their address and we'll send them an analog internet when I come about making them. So at first, the potential of gleaning any new knowledge from this mailing seems to be, as I said, uh, rendered obsolete by time, since these articles reference out-of-date information, incomprehensible by volume, since each mailing contains a vast assortment of decontextualized information scraps, and limited in scope, since choice is limited to what I decide to put in the mailing to begin with. So with these limitations in mind, this paper-based digital relief contains some noteworthy news that's still worth sharing. Um, even though the act of preservation itself is rendered absurd. Okay, so I'm going to just get right to the paper. Spaces of Activism Occupy Montreal. From the influence of Arab Spring, to, in 2011, to the ongoing Occupy movement, the notion of public space as contested raises questions of social and spatial justice for all within art and architectural discourse. During such times of social upheaval, artists, architects, and planners can play a vital role in reshaping our public spaces as sites of actions, meanings, and possibilities, thereby changing our environments as lived spaces. The questions I explore are how does the structure of cities change when ordinary citizens assert their rights to the streets, squares, and parks in public displays of resistance? What spatial transformations of the public space promote participatory actions pushing for social and cultural shifts? Is there an opportunity for architects to envision a democratic space for all peoples to participate in? I investigate how Square Victoria, an urban public space in downtown Montreal, amidst its corporate and financial giants, transformed into an occupied site, thus impacting the structure of the city. Firstly, through mass occupation and demonstration, citizens, regardless of their ethnicity, gender, or social differences, asserted their power to create a rupture in the city. Secondly, I state that the physical space was altered by the citizens' democratic will through peaceful protests using basic tactics, new technological tools, and innovative organizational skills. In the process, a new temporary typology of living was created which was fluid and dynamic, full of potential to promote direct participatory actions and empowerment. Thirdly, I contend that despite its challenges, the Occupy movement has the potential to empower ordinary people to assert their rights to the city to create common spaces through their collective, collective actions in the public realm. Three critical frameworks provide an interdisciplinary lens to interrogate Occupy movement. The literature of social movement engages spatial theory in public spaces. The artistic practices of socially engaged participatory arts and the role of media in propagating mediated and uh, representational imagery to disrupt both physical and network spaces. Primary data was collected and recorded into a database from activists, journalists, businesses, and other individuals. The visual and material traces left by spatial planning, temporary structures, art and artifacts, and media coverage corroborates the collected information. Using Jonathan Massey's methodology of mapping Liberty Plaza as a precedent, the encampment in three critical phases formed the basis of my analysis. The site's physical features were investigated to reveal social behavioral patterns and spatial organization. The phenomenological aspects as embodied through its materiality, texture, color, shape, i.e. the sensorial and the relational aspect of the temporal encampment was mapped to decipher if there were any common activity patterns between occupied sites. This approach provides a qualitative analysis of Occupy Montreal in Victoria Square and its interpretive output. The political aspect of the public realm as conceptualized by theorist Hannah Arendt and Jürgen Habermas are relevant to my research. Arendt employs the Greek agora as a metaphor for the space of appearance, 
where citizens and uh, her citizens are mostly white male uh, who gather together in the Agora to question and create a discourse. I am using her methodology of the Agora to incorporate multiple publics. And I say that citizens gather together to express opinions democratically. Whereas Habermas's uh, action is, uh, or notion is based on communicative opportunities where internet cafes and social media platforms offer just as important spaces of communication as urban squares and parks. In the contemporary social descents of the 21st century that we are all privy to, Physical urban spaces working together with social media platforms provides catalysts to create common ground and collective power. Sociologist Andre Lafayre's um, questions on collective action to create something radically different in the public space asserts the criticality of spatial tactics within architectural discourse. Post-structuralist ph philosopher uh, Judith Butler speaks and picks up on Lafayre's notion of the power of the embodied performative body to generate collective power within the temporal encampment as it negotiates and alters the built environment. <coughs> the relevance of spectatorship, relational aesthetics, and space are key concepts in the public sphere of socially engaged participatory arts. Art critic Claire Bishop theorizes that the conservative role of the artist has shifted to engage artistic medium and material in the manner of theater and performances. Finally, the role of media as an extension of folk culture propagating mediated representational imagery to disrupt both physical and network spaces in the public spheres offers a new understanding as per theorist Henry Jen Jenkins. Communications professor D. Souza Silvia posits that although digital interfaces make geography physically irrelevant, they provide opportunities for connectivity between social networks and physical environment. It opens up possibilities as new ways as I explore the role of public space in network environments. My aim is to draw relationships from multiple inputs that will offer new perspective on space and its impact on citizen groups through an interdisciplinary approach. I believe that we as architects and artists can play a critical role to create spaces that are suitable for all publics, with a S included, by applying relevant skills and knowledge equitably. So, I would like to start um, with an artwork made by John Klima in 2002 to raise the issue that I'm going to talk about in this presentation. His work is called uh, Political Landscape Emotional Terrain, which is a data visualization project that contains three maps. The first one is a topographical map, the second one is an emotional map that examines life expectancy, and the last one is a political map of operation and human rights abuse. Those maps, as written in the work description, are a way to show how we use landscape as a metaphor to describe a seemingly unrelated human condition. One step further, in a data visualization context, it also shows us how we can take life, reduce it into numbers and data, and give this information an aesthetic representation. Political landscape emotional terrain, based on official data from the World Health Organization, U.S. Geological Survey, and the United Kingdom, is an artistic research of the current state of the world. But it doesn't end there since those maps are interactive and activated by A-Star, an algorithm used mostly in a computer games to help the character navigate its way across the surfer with the least amount of obstacle, be it the topographical, the emotional, or the political terrain. Therefore, it is not a mere representation of, of statistics, but also provides the user with active tools to explore the relations between the political, the personal, and the geographical. The internet is perceived as a field that can rise above material issues of uh, territory, race, gender, and control. This is true after hours of exploring, chatting, and sharing on the web, we often get the feeling that every notion of time and space completely disappears. 
For this reason, since the mid-90s, many artists and activists use the internet as a tool for tactical actions, which correspond to social political events. In my study, I will focus on tactical media that deal with the subject of borders and movement. The contrast between the simplicity in navigating online and the difficulty to do so in real life, especially for asylum seekers and foreign workers, raises questions about the relations between virtual and physical space and the efficiency of the internet as part of the symbolic field of semiotic regime in shaping and promoting an actual change. One reason for using the internet for tactical means is the belief that, I'm starting this quote, in a time when almost all the space has been privatized and free speech zones have been reduced to cages topped with barbed wire, the internet can still serve as a common where people can gather together to create positive social change. This excerpt, excerpt was taken from the website of SWOM, the initials for Southwest Action to Resist the Minutemen. The project was a collaboration between the collective Electronics Disturbing Theater an activist from the area of Tijuana and San Diego that organized a virtual sit-in in 2006 against website of California and Arizona Minutemen Organization, Save Our State Initiatives, and congressional representatives supporting anti-immigrant legalization. More than 78, 500,000 users participated the sit-in via Floodnet application developed by Electronic Disturbance Theater in, in 1998. Flooded was aimed to target website with a denial of service attack that prevents from actual user to enter those sites. The participant sends request file from the service of the, target, of the targeted websites, like justice, freedom, and the name of those who were killed while trying to cross the borders, files that could not be found by the servers. The goal was to interfere the website by slowing them down, and the administrator of the service to realize what were the cause for the problem by seeing the thousand requests for justice and the names of the dead. This optimistic belief in the potential of the internet can be found among other art collectives that emerged in the 90s, such as Art Critical Ensemble. They claim that because the nature of power has become nomadic and decentralized, the resistance itself should move from the street to network and virtual space. Once the act of protest enters into the cybernetic field, it also influences the way we are perceiving reality itself. An example for that is the Border Hack Manifesto in, uh, from 2000, that takes the struggle against uh, the European treatment of illegal immigrants and bring it to the United States-Mexico border. You can see all kinds of uh, posters from the different campaigns uh, in the European No Border Network and also uh, the one that occurred in the US-Mexico. Um, the term hacking using the manifesto is explained as the penetration, exploration, or investigation of a system with the goal of understanding it, not of destroying it. Thus, hacker investigates software, for example, in order to improve it, much in the same way the artists and activists come to the border so they could learn about it and the role they play in it. Even though the place chosen to set camp for the border hack inv investigation is in front of the actual border, the US-Mexico border can also be understood as a symbolic terrain. A border is the point in which everything looks possible but inaccessible. A place where, according to the manifesto, the people, and I'm starting a quote, can smell the future coming from the freeways, from Silicon Valley, from Hollywood, but yet we are trapped in a muddy hill with unpaved street. And in that symbolic point, a camp for net art, border cinema, conferences, and workshops was built for a few days to deal with the partition of forced and third worlds, the one-sidedness of the border only to the north but not to the south, and the question of who is considered to be legal and who is not. But the stability of borders cannot be reduced into immigration and physical borders. Between the years 2001 to 2011, Heath Bunting and Rachel Baker were working on borders in Guy, crossing and documenting national borders within the European Union and without using any papers or relevant uh, documents. Here in this um, diagram you can see um, uh, the different cr borders that they tried to cross. Uh, the, grand one, the gray one are the one that they didn't uh, manage to do it yet. The green one is, are the one that they try that succeedingly uh, cross, cross. And the yellow and the blue one are the one that was much more difficult to do so. It took uh, a few times because of the weather, the physical condition, etc. Um, the rationale for this guide was the fact that European countries were unified under the same currency, but when it comes to physical mobility for people, even tourists and citizens, it is still difficult to cross borders. For Bounty Borders and Guide is a part of a larger investigation of creating uh, maps and alternative networks that will bypass the global economy network. 
In order to see the documentations of Bounty website, one has to log on the internet only from authorized public spaces such as galleries, universities, and coffee houses. Citizens living in a country with some kind of conflict also have full access. But the ideal spot to log into the guide will be in one of the locations of the physical trip, since the whole idea of this guide is eventually to head out and cross the actual borders without going through the official checkpoints. And this is an example of crossing uh, the Strasbourg uh, and um, Germany border. Um, it's explained vividly how to, which document uh, equipment do we need to do so, uh, documentation of the journey itself, and eventually the conclusion uh, of, of crossing the border. Mm. In order to see, um, sorry, um, in this way, borders in guide uh, goes out against any kind of uh, a private consumption by restricting access to the guide for private IP addresses. That's also breaking the myth that the internet is borderless. According to Critical Arden Symbol, the net is culturally and politically border, and its meaning is constructed under the authority of capital's variable of separations. By, reverse, by reversing the situation, make it so that the internet is restricted and physical movement is encouraged, we also stop taking for granted the online freedom of access of knowledge as an obvious assumption. The internet is not just a tool for tactical action, but also an essential part of the late capitalist and global logic. Its power to change its structure is therefore limited. And it's not only the online activism that is li limited in dealing with material issues, but the whole region of the symbolic is put into doubt. Ricardo Dominguez, one of the co-founders of Electronic Disturbance Theater, acknowledged the fact that acts of electronic civil disobedience, such as swarm, has only a cer certain symbolic efficiency. The power is decentralized and therefore has presence in the virtual space as well as the physical one. For that reason, no actual damage will be caused simply by disturbing its websites. The feeling of powerlessness can be understood through the, 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 the character of the tactic itself, in that it is determined by the absence of power. According to Michel de Soto, tactic is an action that is lacking its own place and therefore will always be temporal and limited by the possibility of the moment. In short, a tactic is an art of the weeks, or as David uh, Garcia and Phil Clovin phrase it in their manifesto, the ABC of tactical media, it is the art of the happy negatives. Those are groups and individuals who are feeling detached from the dominant culture and its symbols, but will nevertheless make use of it in different ways, more creatively and critically. This is why tactical media is not concerned with statements about the impact it might have on the future or with establishing an alternative infrastructure for the subject of criticism. This is tactical media drawback, but also its strength. By refusing to become a consistent and stable strategy, tactical media always maintain alert vibrancy and constant awareness, hopping from one project to another, establishing collaboration with different people, and staying true to its first intention of blurring boundaries and taking advantage of the internet for the, uh, to the fullest. Uh, I have a few questions. I think uh, Deborah may have some questions. Um, I should also say, Deborah is an independent curator and writer who has organized numerous exhibitions on subjects relating to American modernism and contemporary art for major museums and nationally. Um, her book list is long. Her books include Philip Gustin's Poor Richard and Abstract Expressionism, Movements in Modern Art, as well as recent exhibition catalogs, Dev O'Keefe, Circles of Influence After Many Springs, Regionalism, Modernism in the Midwest, um, and yeah, she teaches her too. So, Deborah, did you have any questions that came to mind? I'd like to ruminate on some of your questions. Okay. Um, well, so I met with almost everyone before they came here through Skype. Um, but one thing I didn't ask anyone was just where did your papers come from? Did you do them for classes or did you do, do them for um, just personal benefit? Um, well, yeah, my paper, I mean, originally kind of like the, the term of it came out of a class um, term paper that I wrote, but then kind of like extended into various other like terrains of inquiry, but it was like, it's a class on media and genre in the 17th and 18th century, so I mean, uh, we were just like reading a lot of like early theater and like, uh, like novels and such, and like using contemporary media theory to kind of like approach um, like all forms of media. So, but I mean, in in leading up to this conference, I kind of like started to think a lot about its um, the project's uh, relevance to visual art, which is something that I hadn't thought of really much about or written about ever. So like I was kind of just 
trying to like apply this um, this project for a, a literature class into uh, like the domain of uh, visual arts. I think that's I guess working for me. Um, so I this project I working on and I've presented in different forms uh, and I do other projects as well that sort of look about or sort of explore the relationship of humans to information in sort of co-creative ways this one less so and uh, and that is why I am sort of beginning to pursue a PhD at the Faculty of Information to sort of pursue a practice based exploration of um, of these relationships and so this was an opportunity to sort of reflect on, on this project uh, in a written form, which I had to do. Yeah. So as an architect, I was always very, uh, you know, interested in space, especially the space that I, as an immigrant student, kind of encountered um, in, in the United States. And then eventually, after 9-11, my, my children are sort of subjected to in terms of uh, racial profiling and all of that. And they have never been to my original country. They have always been born here as American citizens. But yet they are uh, conflicted now, uh, especially as they travel back and forth. And, and so I was always interested in public space. And uh, I, I guess uh, exploring that for my MFA in digital media and interior design, I got introduced to the notion of uh, installation art in a gallery format. And taking that further, I was uh, I met with Christoph Vodishko at Harvard and MIT to see if I could, um, you know, take my sort of interrogation further, um, which I'm kind of working on it with him. But then an opportunity came up at, at McGill to do a, a, a postgraduate work in cultural mediations and technology, and that was the time when Occupy was, we were right in the midst of Occupy, and being in Quebec kind of helped me uh, anchor my ideas and my conflicts uh, in, in the city where there was already, already there was so much conflict, and I, being a colonial myself, you know, having gone through uh, con uh, uh, convent schools and then being here and getting my education here. I, I sort of could relate to that kind of environment. And so I use this as my thesis for my uh, graduate work, which I'm still continuing to develop as I teach architecture in focus studios and to really challenge architectural students to see themselves not just as form givers and, and sort of just uh, service providers, but to become social agents of change in the public space and, and to become part of this discourse, which normally doesn't happen because we are always trying to make things and we never think about theory, although we are taught theory. So McGill was a great breakthrough for me, as was my MFA at, at UGA. So I'm trying to expand my, my disciplinary bounds into an interdisciplinary, if you will, uh, to engage these other kinds of uh, focus areas. Um, this is part of uh, my MA thesis that I started working on in the last month. Um, and I'm just in the beginning where I just mostly um, collect all past experiments that are still happening, um, that it's easier to find uh, those um, in mostly in the European borders and US Mexico. And I'm hoping to use it as a case study also to, um, to examine uh, the asylum seeker issues in, in Israel and to see how, if there are also similar um, projects that also occur in. Uh, in my country to, to raise the, the problems of, uh, of physical borders that um, um, it's very hard to, to define and, and also the way that um, um, the problems that come from the outside to Israel can also um, make it aware of other problems um, inside Israel population, whether it's uh, the relations between uh, periphery and central cities or the different um, ethnic, um, um in inside the Israel population 
Um, and those uh, projects were kind of uh, inspiring me to see the whole issues of South Seeker in Israel in a much more different point of view and how can we use this tool in order to, s to try to solve those problems and also there. So, so everyone's papers comes from, come from academics? Yeah. yeah. And personal interrogation. Yeah, I was going to ask how do you, um, how did your topics or how did your um, sort of styles vary from, or differ from the people who you study, your peers or your professors? So, if I may. Um, when I went to McGill, and those of you who are from <laughs> Montreal can probably attest, uh, my topic was viewed very uh, uh, discursively and doubtfully, because that, it was the time that it, we were uh, going through the student movements. And so I was getting reactions from faculty and students thinking that I was politically engaged with their uh, sort of qualms about tuition hikes or, or social... Um, Maybe you'd like to explain to us <laughs> that don't know what that move, student movement is about. Okay, so the student movement in Montreal was in 2011, and it was against tuition hikes. Uh -huh. and, and, and so this was the sort of, there was a history to it. And it, I don't think it was the money that was more important as more the value and the concept. <laughs> and, and if anyone of you might want to add to that. And so the whole city was in, was, was in a chaos because students were going to you know, demonstrations. And from my research, <coughs> I found out that the Occupy movement had happened just prior to that. And so the Occupy movement gave them the infrastructure, if you will, to then kind of organize themselves. And the student movement was huge in, 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 at that time when I started my uh, graduate work. It was in Quebec. It was Quebec. And long. And, and, and long, too. It was huge and long. And it was yeah. huge and long. And I, and I walked many of those as well. There were walks, protests every night for like six months on, yeah. on top of major protests on the 22nd of each month. Of 22nd. And, and there was police brutality. There was neighborhoods who would, uh, you know, organize themselves with pots and pans. So even if you went from Montreal to Quebec City to all these other places, there was uh, at 10 o'clock at night or something like, or 8 or something, the whole city would walk, you know, in, into these. So it created a lot of havoc in downtown Montreal for students who were not engaged or were not supporting the, the, the issues, you know, and, and I feel like McGill was one of them which kind of alienated themselves from what was going on. And, and so my topic was then seen as more like a political, but I was looking at the physical impact of what city streets do to these protests and how whether they support it or they don't support it. How can squares be then transformed? And where can people get together? There were times that these people were kettled into, you know, these groups. There's a lot of very conflicted time in Montreal, and, and people saw I as a supporter of them, and I was really looking at the impact of architecture and the spaces to whether to, uh, you know, whether people can come together in groups or not. Especially in the form of kettling, because yeah, kettling very much was really and <coughs> it engages it yeah. it architecture. It, Absolutely, it, you use the architecture to surround. So it, it, it sort of changes that, that notion of what mm -hmm. the building does and its relationship to the people. In that sense. And in preparation for this, I was going back to the Occupy Montreal website and Facebook page to see what was happening, and that's where the last quote is from that, you know, that has sort of become the play, the city of repression in Canada. <laughs> and, and, and the police is very proud of what they are doing, you know, they are just like, so there's, I mean, there's a lot more to it that I don't understand. And, and I want to kind of continue this research to, 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 to really understand the state of what each one of us are going through in our cities. But like with this Missouri, uh, Thing, you know, in Atlanta, I'm in Atlanta right now, and people came together the night the verdict was, uh, and you know, you could see Peachtree Street, which is our major street in Atlanta, they were confined to just the uh, footpaths or, or the sidewalks, and then there was a, a line of police cars almost 
<laughs> you know, as if you are in a procession, uh, like they were accompanying them. That was so. Is that a protest? What is our city streets becoming? You know, do we really have freedom? So these are all questions that I think architectural students must you know, engage with as they're going through their uh, academic careers. Because once you get into practice, then it's very individual. So I think we have a social responsibility to kind of take this further. You use the term relational aesthetics in your paper. And I think that that, um, that, that um, idea unifies many of the papers here. Perhaps not yours, Robin, but three other papers here. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on, on how? So I feel like, you know, when Claire Bishop, I'm very interested because this book, when it came, came out, the whole notion of participatory arts and, you know, how art is also going into an area where we are talking about social, the questions that affect us as a humanity. And, and, and so what each one of us does, I, I feel, has a relationship in, in a larger context. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was looking at it more as an affective dimension so that people there were really, really critical to the environment that, that kind of came out of it. And so in that sense, the, what the artists did with, with just the posters or, or, or you know, doing jam sessions or, or whatever, it kind of all came together to then create this environment that kind of affected. And it was always in a sense of transitional. Mm -hmm. in the long term, so that's, I guess, where I was. More, do you think that um, relational aesthetics is an extension of your paper as well? Um, I think the opposite, that the, really? the, 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 um, because if, if I remember correctly, the, the relational aesthetic, it's the way of taking um, the current situation of the ordinary life and put it in, inside the gallery's context and mm -hmm. to examine it as some kind of a lab or something. And I think they, what those uh, collaboration between the activists and artists did was, um, was the opposite, to use all kinds of different aesthetic languages and to bring it to, bring it to the actual place that um, those issues are happening mm -hmm. and to expand the gallery spaces and also uh, to expand, um, um, uh, to, 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 to delete the boundaries of life and art um, but not only as some kind of experiment, but also to, to really try to, uh, to, to make an impact. Right. Um, but it has, you know, it has accrued um, larger meanings in the past yeah. 20 years, too. And one of them is, is that um, we no longer think of the studio and a, and a private space. We think of a public space mm -hmm. in terms of <coughs> yeah. relational aesthetics. And we also think of the audience, um, not passively, but mm -hmm. the audience as a community. Yeah. Yeah. And where are the boundaries, I guess, mm -hmm. is the larger question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that note that, um, I guess the point you're raising in relation to Bishop, but that ne necess and you touched, you're talking about it too, this, that need for using it as an antagonizer rather than sort of a sing, like reflective of a singular community, mm -hmm. then, or like multiple participants across virtual spheres. So is the analog internet a collaborative or a group of one, like the Atlas group? <laughs> what do you mean? Your, the, your the project, project yeah, yeah, it's just me. It's it's just just I started okay. the first one as a friend, and he was like, good luck to you and your endeavors. <laughs> uh, okay. He wanted to do the jokes, and I was like, I, re I was really pushing for the book. But, uh, th and uh, so I, it's, it's just something I do. I do it every few months. Um, make about anywhere between 10 and 35 at a time, and it's and I sort of just send them out. Yeah. Do you send them to anyone who you yeah. have never met? Yes, definitely. Yeah, people I've never met. People are, like if I, I don't go and find. That's a lie. <laughs> addresses. If if it's someone I've I've found their address, it's their work address, and I found them through university. Like uh, to academics, so I feel because it's going to an office, it's perhaps less invasive in that way. But I like the idea of the unsolicited. Do you worry about the fate of your books when you set them out to random people? Yes, <laughs> and and that's something I, I failed to touch on that like the key players, the key participants in this are do not know that they're part of, and those are the mail carriers. 
and they're the key performers, and uh, and you, it's this, and that's why it's this. Uh, I mentioned like this trusting of the archaic. There's so many like opportunities for failure in this system of it getting lost in the mail, and it has happened and to someone I know that I sent it to. It has yet has yet to arrive. I hope I hope in like five years time it kind of like shunts itself off somehow to get there. But, yeah. Robin, I had a question for you too. I mean, um, do you ever think about the alphabet as an organizing structure? Um, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, it's itself. Like, I mean, it kind of like has like phonemic and like sort of like like ways of like organizing words that um, that other sort of like um, pictorial like ways of, of representing language like doesn't. Like might might do differently, but um, right. uh, yeah, it is it is interesting. Like how um, actually alphabetization as like as uh, a standardization technique actually comes about kind of late. It's 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 like as a you know it's like a, a, an order for for which like things are, are going to be placed. Like most early libraries don't have like uh, alphabetization, which I thought was like really interesting. Um, okay, that's like, interesting. You know, yeah. Like the the very the very early like in Canada, like libraries like after because like coming out of manuscript culture like I mean like I had dressed in the paper it just there was no like I mean standardization of organization it just like kind of people had to devise their own like within their individual libraries so it would, you know very incredibly across across libraries. And, um, were, they, were they organized through numbers? Or just yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah so numbers yeah. are something that are re representative of, of the thing mm -hmm. rather than of the concept, like the letters. So yeah. You, okay. Yeah. I'm just making sure I'm on that thread. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. I was also thinking about various letters from the 19th, 19th century onwards who mm -hmm. have used the dictionary, you know, as a literary genre. Like, well, there's dictionary of perceived yeah. ideas, and then in the, in the late 20th century, we have a little bard. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, like the the dictionary is like, I mean, it's it has like this like way of of like storing and referring and like this like point of reference upon like um, that creates sort of like a mutual kind of like uh, I don't know, like way of, of I don't know defining the way. I'm not. I mean, like, not sure how it I don't know could be structured in, in, indexically, but I mean. Dictionaries are really interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we might have one question, time for one question. If anyone has a burning question. Mm -hmm. it is. It's a good question, but I was, uh, th thank you all for the, the panels. I, was, is, I, had, I think a more visceral reaction to the viewers because of the like, uh, no, yeah. they have interest in, in all that. Uh, well, thank you for the wonderful slide of uh, Victoria Square. Like, I knew all all of these elements, but for the first time I'm realizing that there's a, a Paris subway entrance, and there's a statue of Victoria, yeah, and then there's like international side slash postmodernism, mm -hmm. financial mm -hmm. uh, uh, towers, and glass. So it's like all these things come together in Victoria Square. It's fantastic. Um, the, the Paris, the British Empire, and the like. Yeah, it's a great colonial uh, but the 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 place where I think I'm I'm, I'm not sure where you stand on that. Like I think I have an idea, but I, I do, uh, there's a back and forth on it. Um, I'm totally undecided, and I, it's it's like a dilemma or a catch twenty two for me. Like the whole idea of um, uh, can you orchestrate like disobedience and dissent as an architect, as a builder? Mm -hmm. like, I'm, I, and I'm always coming back to this discussion between uh, Robert Smithson and I think the other guy is Capra, but I'm not sure, but it's, Smithson's yeah. point is, like, I need the authority of the museum to put holes in their mm -hmm. walls, like, what, what, could you, what, would, what would I do without, like, this authority, what would we do with, like, com com <laughs> complete freedom, I mean, and what's our, like, psychoanalytic, uh, an analytical, unconscious, fetishistic relation to authority in terms of yeah. disobedience and and can you, like, as an I mean, it's, like, a, it's a question that my studio is also dealing with. Can you really orchestrate space for, I mean, can you really yeah. orchestrate yeah. protest? Because if you say yes, you can, then it's not no longer a protest, yeah. right? You That's, identify. yeah, you've yeah. identified it. So it's really very interesting that we were looking at it within the context of, of Atlanta and its downtown, you know. Um, I think as architects, you, you 
I mean, as any artist or architect, I, I think you cannot orchestrate a protest or disruption, but it happens. So what you can do is kind of provide an infrastructure so that you know there is uh, capabilities of, of, of coming together. So I think why Victoria is very interesting is because you know, underground subway pulls you right up into Victoria Square if you will through that, through that metro station. But, and, and it allowed people to come together uh, from different areas of Montreal in, into this one central space. But what happened interestingly was the, the Montreal Stock Exchange and the, you know, the international trade and all these W hotels and, and everything else around it really did not get disrupted because they had their own underground entrances as well. So it, 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 yeah, and, and, and so if you will, you know, physically it allowed people to come together in the central space, but virtually and, and tactically, you know, they were really not uh, subjected to it only just visually, sound-wise, because there was a lot of things. So again, that whole notion of relational kind of comes in. And if you didn't want to engage with it, you were, it was quite okay for you to do that, which cannot happen in other cities, I presume. So I think Montreal in that sense was very, very interesting that where it happened. Going back to whether as architects or artists you can create a space for it, I think you can provide an infrastructure and you can think about collective actions and, and I think that's where we need to kind of engage with. That would be my, and anyone else can add. Yes. I, I, I would just add something because to me, where like those student protests uh, becomes very interesting in terms of the space that are occupying is when we leave that square Victoria place to go in the house, uh, housing and uh, very like family places, oh, okay. areas in Montreal and where we would walk. And I think like that shift from a center we, yeah. where we oppose to all all that a big idea of power structure and we are going actually in our like very appro appropriated yeah, uh, neighborhoods yeah. uh, is much more uh, ca capable to uh, yeah. make some kind of a social discussions yeah. about the things and I think that's a very special thing with, would be that people would be like very in a solidarity moment but also uh, in a very divided moment so people between friends, between students from mm -hmm. uh, McGill and mm -hmm. and between families were very divided oh, yes, on that <laughs> question. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm just asking myself the question now, like, is it like more profitable to manifest in those like financial districts or in the neighbor, the actual neighborhoods where we will have discussion, discussions in the very basic levels, like mm -hmm. the family cells, for example, or, you know. This one, if, you, if do I have a minute to just read yeah, this? Yeah, I think so. So um, this professor, Marcos Anschelowski, he was a social uh, uh, sociologist at McGill, and then I think he went to Ukan. He kind of, and I'm quoting him, he says that the symbolic gestures giving new names to public squares, people deliberating, making public statements, people also meeting new activists, ties being built, strong ties, trust being built that basically turns the assembly and all occupations into sites of contention, sites of coalition building, of coordination, that you feed mobilization processes beyond and after occupation. So he's kind of talking about that it gave us that, that ability to think of ourselves as, uh, as social animals, if you will, to organize ourselves and, and, and question and discourse and see that we are not as alienated through our media, you know, that we interact with, but that we do uh, come together as social animals and social beings to question. I, I think his, his discourse is very interesting that you might want to kind of look at too. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you all. And I think it's time for lunch.